Good evening, everybody. Merry Christmas. Welcome to Christmas at New Hope. If you're ever, would you please stand and ready yourself for a joy-filled, colourful Christmas.
hands again. You've got to get a little warm and a bit more movement. Claps on two or four. Just follow me. Yeah. Tell it on the mountain that she 
Why don't we lift up a loudest shout of praise together? Hey, it is wonderful to, wonderful to be together on this Christmas Eve night. Why don't you grab four people around you and wish them a Merry Christmas as you grab your seat this evening. Welcome, welcome along this evening. It is great to be together. What an exciting uh, service that we have Christmas Eve. It's always a wonderfully exciting uh, time of the year and time to celebrate and be together. If you hope's home to you, you're here regularly throughout the year, a just special welcome to you uh, on this Sunday evening. And if you're visiting, maybe you're here from interstate, maybe you've come with a family member, maybe you don't normally come along to here to New Hope or even to church. We're just so glad that you're here tonight. Uh, we have a really special welcome to you and we trust that you enjoy the colour, the sound and the fun of being together here on this Christmas Eve. So a very Merry Christmas to each of you and it's wonderful to celebrate together tonight. We have a little Christmas gift for you on the way out, a little chocolate ball that'll be there at the doors. And so I really want to encourage each of you to grab one of those chocolate balls on the way out. And now here's the deal. I don't want any like, you know, politeness and saying, oh no, not for me. I've got a Christmas lunch to go to tomorrow. None of that, all right, tonight. Because as we all know, for these two days, chocolate is worth negative calories. And so you need to take the opportunity to eat and eat and eat as much chocolate as you can. And any of the chocolate left over, I will be eating it. And I would hate to waste away with all those negative calories at the end of our Christmas services. So please take that chocolate gift from us on the door, at the door on the way out. Uh, we would love to give you that small gift as a token of our appreciation for celebrating together this evening. Hey, just on your seats, uh, there's this card. I just want to uh, make a note of that. I'm going to speak to it more in a few uh, minutes time, but... Uh, every year at Christmas, we give to Baptist World Aid to support their work. There's a number of opportunities that you can give uh, to this work. We're going to pass the buckets around a little bit later in our service. But I'm just giving you a heads up because if you need to fill out details on this card, if you know you're going to give and, and you want to fill out the details, I just want to give you a few minutes uh, to do that. And uh, I'll come back and give you some more details and content a little bit later in our service. Now, very exciting. It's Christmas Eve. And everybody knows Christmas Eve is the most exciting night of the year. It's hard to go to sleep. I will struggle to go to sleep tonight. And we are so eager for tomorrow. Now, everybody who is 12 and under, if you're older, you're welcome to come as well. But 12 and under in particular, I want to invite you to come to the front of the room and join me here because Beck is going to bring a very special Christmas message for you. So all the kids in the room, please come to the front and can we welcome Beck as she joins me on the platform here. <laughs> Am I on? Can you hear me? <laughs> Where are all the kids? Quick! Come out here, it's really scary, all these big adults. <gasps> How are you? Come sit down on, no, on the, oh, you know what? Why not? On the stage. <laughs> Just join me. It's so much fun. Can you sit down for me? Take a seat. <gasps> I think we should all say Merry Christmas, New Hope. Uh, can everyone say Merry Christmas, New Hope? Merry Christmas. Oh, Merry Christmas, New Hope. <laughs> Wow, who is excited for Christmas? <gasps> now, Lance, I might actually need your help with the microphone. What? One, one more sleep and tomorrow's. <gasps> Thank you for reminding me. But can I ask you a question? Do you really get any sleep? Because in my house, I have to say, I think Christmas Eve is the worst sleep of all. 
Does the Grinch, oh dear, the Grinch says that. Okay. Oh, there you go. So, I want to know what traditions you might have at Christmas time. Can anyone tell me a tradition, so something you do every Christmas that you might have at Christmas time? We, we have a no. family. We go somewhere to meet no. with our family. No. <laughs> wow, that's a half great. tradition, that one. <laughs> what do you do every Christmas? Uh, we get presents. <gasps> presents. Maybe one more, Lance. We go camping for the New Year's, and I just wish I could stay home for the New Year's at least just once. <laughs> There you go. Well, I have some friends. And my friends' names are the Piccolo family. And the Piccolo family had this tradition every single Christmas that on Christmas Eve, their grandparents came over. And Grandpa Joe, he was a wise old man. Hands up if you've got a nice, kind granddad. Yeah. Well, you know what, grandpas like to teach us a lesson, don't you, granddads? Yeah. And this Christmas, Granddad Joe, he came into the house and he only bought one present. But there was four kids in the family. Hands up if you find it hard to share. Oh my goodness. So Grandpa Joe has this one present and he wants to give it to the kids. So he's like, all right. He goes, he decides, well, I wonder who's going to open it. The oldest, of course. The oldest always gets to open the presents. I'm the youngest. (laughs) So Grandpa Joe looks at the oldest and his name was Tom. And he looked at Tom And he said, Tom, remember, read the tag. Now, who reads the tag? How boring is that? Well, Grandpa Joe wanted the kids to read the tag. So Tom looked at the present, and he looked at the first tag. And the first tag said, can you read it for me, Leo? Let the present remind remind you of the gift. Let the presents remind you of the gift. And Tom looked at his granddad and thought, hmm, okay. But then looked at his granddad again and his granddad went, all right, you can open the presents. So what do you do on Christmas when you get to open the presents? You're like, wrap, let's rip it. Open! Oh my goodness, it's very hard. And he was so excited, he ripped the present open and inside it oh, was a box. Oh, oh my goodness, rip, 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 rip! Because it's so exciting. And he looked inside the box. And what was in the box? It was another present. Now, Tom got to open the first present. Second oldest was Jack. So I think Jack got to open this present. And so Jack was all ready. He was about to open the present. But Grandpa Joe, Grandpa Joe said, you must read the tag. So, okay. Jack read the tag. Can you read it for me? Let the presents remind you of the gift. Let the presents remind you of the gift? Oh, Grandpa Joe. So he looked at Grandpa and Grandpa Joe gave him the nod and he went, awesome, let's open the presents. Rip it up, rip, rip, rip. Because it's so exciting on Christmas morning when you get to open all the presents. No, no. He opened the box. And inside was a... Another present! 
Amen. Oh, so then, this time it was the second oldest child, and her name was Shan. And Shan was so excited because she got to open the present next. But Grandpa Joe, guess what he said? Read the tag. I wonder if you know what the tag might say. It's going to be another book in the book. I wonder if, do you know what, do you know what the tag says though? Oh, the tag says, let the presence remind you of the so Sean was so excited. She looked at Grandpa Joe and he gave her the nod. All right, you can open the present now. And she's like, oh, rip, 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 rip. What's it going to be? Another box. And she, oh, she opened the box. And guess what was inside? Well, oh, Hannah, Hannah was the youngest child in the family and now it was her turn. And so she looked at Grandpa and Grandpa Joe, guess what he said? Read, that's right, Eden, read the tag. And the tag said, let the present remind you of the gift. Now, guess what? She never opened the box in the end. You have to come back next Christmas Eve to find out what's inside. But actually, it doesn't matter what's in the box. And it doesn't matter what you get for Christmas. Because... You have to let the presence remind you of the gift. And what do you think the gift of Christmas might be? Summer. Yeah. Pardon? Yeah, God and how he gave Jesus. And in kids' church, we have been learning a Bible verse from 1 John 4, chapter 14. And it says, I wonder if you can remember it. I'm going to put that there so no one opens it. It says, it's Jesus' birthday. Yeah. So, the Bible verse that we learned in Kids Church was, the Father has sent his Son to be the Saviour of the world and that is the gift that we have been given we might not want a savior but we need a savior and we talked about in Isaiah the fact that Jesus he is our savior and God named him and he is called your prince of peace he is called your everlasting father he is called, I've gone completely blank, Lance. <laughs> um, no, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Wonderful Counselor or Wonderful Advisor. And I've gone completely blank. Anyway, he was called all these beautiful names. Um, Alan can speak on this later. <laughs> but you know what? Tomorrow morning, you might rip the presents open. You might get your favourite doll. <gasps> or you might get your favourite Tonka truck. Or maybe you'll get your best new pair of undies ever. <sighs> or maybe you might get that very favourite Lego set. I already got You've already got it. Oh, <laughs> Whew. 
Sound is saved. No. But what I want you to remember is tomorrow, when you open your presence and every present that you open under the tree, let the presence remind you of the gift of Jesus, your Saviour. Merry Christmas, everyone. You guys can go and sit down. There's some activities packs up the back if you haven't grabbed one yet. Very well done, Beck and everybody. Kids and animals, they say in show business, eh? That's right. <laughs> we have a number of just wonderful ministries uh, for families at, at New Hope, and we're really looking forward to some uh, excellent stuff next year. Play space, which is a drop in, um, uh, play center during the week, mainly music, kids' church, our preschool, just so many things that happen here on site every week for young families. Boys and girls, I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful day tomorrow. Well, I just want to read to you Luke chapter 2 from verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flock at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest of heaven and on earth peace to those on whom His favour rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Alan will pick up the story in a few moments' time. Hey, I just want to draw our attention back to the Baptist World Aid giving card. And as I mentioned before, Baptist World Aid is the um, organisation that we partner with each Christmas. We give an offering each and every year to Baptist World Aid. And if you're looking for a great organisation to Fund your gift towards Baptist World Aid is one of those great organisations. You can do child sponsorship and a whole range of things with them. But what I love about Baptist World Aid is that their heart is not just to channel funds to an individual person on their own, but actually to support a whole community around that person. Their work around the world and in developing world countries is in community development. Because it's, it's well and good for one person to be lifted up, but if the systems and the structures and the society around them does not change, there's an inevitable barrier that they can't cross. And so Baptist World Aid focuses so much energy and its heart and its work on not only the individual, but also the family the community, the society that they make a part of and to allow that society to self-lead, to self-determine, to understand for themselves and make the decisions what would be best to serve their needs. And so this Christmas as we give to Baptist World Aid, you are giving to this heart for work. You're giving to this idea that is not just an individual but a whole community that is transformed. And it is not some people sitting in office buildings in the West telling them what they should do, but it is those on the ground, it is the Indigenous communities themselves who make the decisions for the path and the future that their community will go on. And so it is a joy for us at New Hope to partner with Baptist World Aid, to direct our giving at Christmas to Baptist World Aid. 
There's a whole bunch of instructions on this card. You can scan the QR code. And as you're sitting at lunch tomorrow, consider and think about the gift that you'd like to give. As I said, you can fill out this card and pop it in the offering buckets. Or if you have cash on hand and you would prefer to do that, you can drop that in the offering bucket. It will come past you in a moment's time. We'll watch a video in just a moment. But before we do, I would love to pray for this gift, this generous gift that we will give to Baptist World's AIDS work. So let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the privilege it is to give just as you have given your son Jesus to us. Lord, for the gifts that are given tonight, we give in humility, we give to honour you, to pass on this gift of love that we receive from you to those who most need it in this world. So Father, may all that we do be in an honour and a praise to you. And may this gift, may these gifts be multiplied for great work towards our brothers and sisters in every corner of this planet. Lord, it's with joy that we give So we give these offerings to you to celebrate all that you have given us in this moment of Christmas. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the offering buckets will be passed around the room now, and we have a video of Baptist World AIDS work. Here's how we often tell a story like this. This is Mina. She never went to school, got married as a child, and didn't even have citizenship papers. Fast forward. Now, Mina raises goats, owns land, and even wins local elections. Your money, our programs. It feels pretty great. Let's do it again. Let's try a different way of telling a story like this. You want to help create a better world. You know brilliant people like Mina don't need to be rescued or fixed. Their story just doesn't start on a level playing field. So the money you give helps clear open paths for Mina to write her story, her way. But you don't need to be the hero to play a role in God's redemptive story. Give now and help create a better world with (laughs) Nina. If you're able, would you stand with us as we sing together? Savior is 
please be seated. The image that will appear behind me on the screen is an invitation to meditate, to reflect, and to respond, to come and adore the Christ child. Silent night, holy night, son of God, love's pure light, radiant beams from thy holy face with the dawn of redeeming grace, Jesus, Lord, at your birth. Jesus, Lord, at your birth. That wonderful song that we sing tonight, it's so lovely to sing it on Christmas Eve. Do you know that the music was written on Christmas Eve day? The minister had written a poem a couple of years earlier, uh, Joseph um, Moore, and he took it to uh, someone in his wider community. It was well known as a songwriter, Mr. Gruber. And on Christmas Eve day, he wrote the tune. The organ wasn't working in the church. They had flooding. So he said, could you write something for the guitar? And here we are 200 years later, still singing it as such a beautiful celebration of Christmas. Songs like that help. They focus the heart. They focus the mind. Images like this help. They focus our minds. And we are invited tonight and every day that we breathe to come and adore him, Christ the Lord. These paintings were done uh, through, the, uh, through, through the years as, as uh, lovely meditation pieces. Sometimes families would commission them, and they would have themselves painted into the, pa the painting to remind them of their calling to worship Jesus. And usually they were, they were intended to be meditated upon. Today we see them in a gallery. If we see them at all, we walk past them quickly and say, that's nice, wonder who did that. Nope, don't know that, painter, and we keep moving. But these were designed to be reflected on, contemplated on, and thought about. This painting by Gerhard van Honhorst is a beautiful image that has three audiences looking at Jesus. Do you notice the three audiences? I'll give you a clue. You're one of them. It is set up so that we can reflect on the angels, these little cherub-like, glee-filled worshipers of Jesus who look into this, this beautiful moment in history, and they know so much about who this is. They know that this is the king of angels born into the world. They know that this is the son of God become the son of man. They know that this is God in the flesh. They know the miracle that is occurring. And they are filled with glee and joy. But do you know what these angels who worship, and all the angels who sing, and all the angels who turn up in the Christmas narrative don't know that you and I can know. They don't know what it is like to know that that Christ came into the world for you, for me. The angels don't know what it is like to be forgiven. They have a reason to sing. They sing because he is the king of the angels and he is the glory of the world and he is the beloved of the Father and he is magnificent. But they don't know what it is to be forgiven of their sins. That is a reason to sing. Mary and Joseph are the second audience. They're looking over the birth of Jesus. Mary up close with the glory in her face. Joseph in the shadows to remind us that this birth is a miracle birth. It is a birth in which God has come into our midst. And Joseph is this amazing provider, protector, but he is not the child's father. And Mary is this obedient daughter of the king, this obedient child who has welcomed God into her very body to be the bearer of the Savior of the world. And she knows some beautiful things about this moment, which the scriptures say she is pondering in her heart. Doesn't she look like she's pondering in that image? 
Doesn't she look like she has a head and a heart full of wonder? That's the way to come to this scene. It's the way to come to this celebration tonight. It's the way to come to Christmas, pondering the wonder of God. But you know, there's something you and I know tonight and have that Mary did not know in the moment that she was with her infant son. The incredible impact of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ over 2,000 years that you and I sit in the stream of and celebrate tonight. That is a reason to sing. You and I are the third audience. And so my question to you tonight is, are you coming to adore him? Are you coming to celebrate him? Are you coming to sing over Jesus because you know the forgiveness of your sin? Because you know that this is God's son come into the world, the very God and very man. Because you know, you know that this changes everything. That's the invitation. And I know that so many of you are here tonight because that's the truth that stirs in your heart. And I know that for so many of us, we are seeking to know God better and to worship and celebrate Him. That's why we come to this occasion tonight. It's why pictures like this were painted. Now, I'm going to ask the tech people to make the picture disappear. Because the real challenge of Christmas and of our lives is to keep in that posture of adoration when the picture isn't there anymore. It's to keep in that, that attitude of God actually came into our world. Oh my goodness. My failings and sins have been forgiven and I can live into a new hope. I can... I can search for God and discover God all around me. I can come and adore Him 24-7. That is the beautiful invitation of Christmas. It's the invitation as we step out of a service like this where the music is up, where, the, where, the, where, 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 where all the elements are aligned and into all the busyness and confusion of whatever it is that will come at you in 2024. It will overwhelm you. It will distract you. It will muddle you up. It will mess with your mind. But the Jesus Christ who shines in glory is always there. We need to be looking. We need to be paying attention. Jesus said as he taught his disciples in John 12, he said, believe in the light while you have the light so that you may become children of the light. Believe in the light while you have the light. That's what you do with the Christmas season. That's what you do with these high points in the church year. You, you lean in and you take everything you can take and you reaffirm that sense of the wonder. Of, you get to know him. You meditate. You think. You ponder. You let the picture sit right in front of you. Let me tell you a story, and then we'll come back to that picture, and then we'll sing again, and then we'll go home and we'll eat cake. We will celebrate with turkey. We will have a wonderful Christmas this year, and I pray your Christmas has the best Christmas, you, your family has the best Christmas you've ever had, but I pray it's great because you're adoring Christ all the while you're doing it. Let me tell you a story about Joshua Bell and the Washington Post. The Washington Post did a fantastic social experiment in 2007. They wondered what would happen if they had a top-class musician play in a subway entrance, in the metro entrance in Washington, D.C. So they engaged Joshua Bell, who is a top-flight violinist. He plays with the top orchestras of the world. He actually plays a $3.5 million Stradivarius. His Stradivarius was made 40 years before the hymn that we're going to sing at the end of this message and 150 years before Silent Night. Uh, he, he, when he plays in concert, he, 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 like he, he, he plays for $1,000 a minute. You know, he's a top flight musician and he plays the kind of music that would make the angels weep. Right? He's good. He's good. He's really good. Wonder what would happen, says the Washington Post, if we got someone of Joshua Bell's class to play in the subway on a Friday morning, starting at 7.51, play for 43 minutes, as a thousand people walk past him, what will happen? Will the beauty captivate their hearts? Will the wonder of his 
extraordinary, exquisite instrumentation and his beautiful phrasing and his astonishing repertoire, will it overwhelm Washington DCers? Well, what do you think? This was a serious research project. They set up a video cam hidden, recorded the whole thing. They intercepted about 40 different people uh, after they had walked through the arcade to follow up with a commuter survey, they said, and ask them questions about their experience. They did lots of planning and scenario planning. I mean, Joshua Bell's a big deal. One of their scenarios, well, what would happen if somebody recognizes him and st you know, they start doing you know, feeds on social media? We could be overwhelmed. We, like, this, could be, this, could be, this could be disastrous. Uh, they went and they asked the director of the National Symphony uh, Orchestra uh, uh, of America, you know, what do you think if we got someone like Joshua Bell? He said, oh, I don't know, maybe 35, 50 people might recognize him. You know, you'd probably get a bit of a crowd. You know, maybe 150 people would kind of, kind of cluster in there and have a watch. What do you think happened? Turn to your neighbor, have a quick conversation. What do you think happened? What do you think happened? All right, well, I'm going to tell you what happened. There were 1,097 people who walked through the arcade that day. 1,097 people in the 43 minutes that he was playing the most incredible music. Seven people stopped for one minute or more to listen. 27 people tossed something in his violin case on the way back by and he made $32.17 for his efforts on that day. Now, how do you feel? What do you do with that? What do you think about that? Did you predict that? I think you might have. Because we know human nature, and we know ourselves. And I suspect that if I had walked through Washington, D.C., uh, the, 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 the arcade where he was playing, I, you know, I, I, I want to believe I would have heard that music and gone, oh, that's beautiful, and stopped for one minute plus. But I just don't know. I just don't know. And this is the challenge. This is the problem. When the painting, the adoration of Christ, is not there, will I see it? When it is not Christmas Day and we're all focused, will I be paying attention? when it's the ordinary everydayness, because you see, that's what Christmas is about. It's not about Christmas cards and a one day a year thing and, you know, God came into the world, hallelujah, that's done, we can move on. It's about God in everything. It's about God in my pains and my, my suffering and my, my, my mistakes, my failures and, and, and offering forgiveness and offering peace and offering guidance. It's about God in the troubled spots of the world. It's about God where nobody is paying attention. Now, there's one beautiful difference between the Joshua Bell story in the Washington Post, and there's a great article in the Washington Post, 27, uh, 2007 rather, really worth a read, as they dis dissect the whole event. What a, what a clever experiment. And they wrestle with, you know, what, why? Are we really that hard-hearted? There's one big difference. And that is, in the Christmas story and continuing every day of your lives and my life, the heavenly realms are nudging us. Do you notice in the Christmas story, nobody just gets it. There's always the nudgings of God. There is always the purposefulness of God at work. That's what we need to be paying attention to all the time, looking, listening, wondering, asking, praying, discerning. God is chasing you. I don't care what you think about God. I know what God thinks about you. And it's astonishing. I don't care what the world thinks about God. What I know is that God loves the world so much so that he gave his only son to actually be our savior, to come in an infant form that makes the angels giggle and Mary ponder, and everyone who has experienced his forgiveness and come to see the trajectory of his impact, celebrate with song and an obedient life. This is the glorious good news. And way, the way it plays out in beauty is when you walk into each day expecting 
God to be playing the violin somewhere, the creator of the universe to be at work somewhere in the, in the, in the unexpected spaces of your life, showing you his loving presence, his eternal hope, his glorious grace. It's there. It's there. Surrender to it and live in it. I'm going to ask the tech folks to put the picture back up because we need to see it one more time. And this is what you do with Christmas. If you're wondering, what do I do with Christmas? Like, what's the point? What you do at Christmas is you believe in the light while you see the light. You pay attention while you're singing the hymns. I, I need to pay attention while I'm, while I'm studying the scriptures. And believing while we have the light gives us the privilege to be children of the light. And that is a whole way of living and looking and seeing and being in God's world. Here's what I know will happen, and I hope you will notice it. God will be present in your Christmas this season. The Christ child will be there. Do you notice a fascinating thing about this picture? He uses a technique called tenebrism. Where's the light coming from in this picture? It's, it's, a, it's a really clever thing that Caravaggio started, and then they all copied it, and Rembrandt did the same thing. If, if you look closely, all the shadows are set up such that the light is coming from where Jesus is. And that is the beauty of what we are invited to come and adore, to bow down and worship, to celebrate. God become flesh. Christ in our world, the light of the world. Believe in the light while you have the light so that you may become children of light. Would you stand together? And let's quickly pray and then sing with gusto and then take this hope of Christmas with us as we step into all that God has for, has for us. Let's pray together. Loving God, all we want to do tonight is see the beauty of Jesus. All we want to do tonight is know the light of Christ in our midst, in our hearts. All we want to do tonight is to worship and adore Him, Christ our Lord. Open our hearts, God, that we may receive, and open our eyes, open our ears, Open our lives that we may see Christ everywhere. For you have come into our world not to be an absent presence, but to be a very present help. You have come into our world to save the world. You have come into our world to change the world. And you are its light. You are its hope. So open our lives to see you, O God. And give us the courage to respond even now to the invitation to come, to come and adore you. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's sing together.
Our reason to sing is Jesus. And if tonight that evokes questions for you and you think, I'd, I'd love to know more, we have the most amazing course. It's an alpha course. Another one will run in February. Folks that would love to give you an early crash course today. And this little booklet that would help you pursue some of the questions that might be percolating in your mind. Just to reflect on why Jesus, the center of this season, the card that's on your seat and giving to Nepal. You can take that with you as I'm going to do. Not prepared to deal with that tonight, but I will deal with that when I'm dealing with all the other presents and thinking about generosity and the spirit of giving and gathering the whole world into the Christmas story. I invite you to do the same. Well, it's wonderful to worship with you together tonight. I want to wish you, together with all of my colleagues on the staff team here at New Hope, a very, very Merry Christmas. 
We trust that you enjoy uh, beautiful things this season, but most of all, that that is anchored in your wonderful sense of who Jesus is, in a growing awareness of what he wants to be in your life and all that he is unfolding in this world in which we live. So tonight, Lord God, we see you born in a manger. Lord Jesus, we proclaim you, Son of God and Son of Man. Loving God, we welcome you. Come, make your home among us. Lord Jesus, we honor you and praise you and choose again to follow you. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless us all.